there, lovelies. Welcome to Flirting with Travel. I'm Lexi. I'm Diambe. And I'm Misty. And here at Flirting with Travel, we're three sisters that love traveling the globe. And our goal is to share stories of our successes, our failures, and our tips to help you navigate the world easier. So today, what are we talking about? We're talking about expatriation, baby. Expats. <laughs> With everything that's going on in the world and goodness knows it's been a sobering couple of weeks to see what's happening i know we've all seen on message boards people saying i'm getting out of this country i'm gonna go live abroad and as each of us have all lived in different countries at different points i'm actually the only one now living in the u.s both misty and dion are just up gallivanting in the world and i'm terribly like envious that. because i can't get out of this country um we wanted to share with you our expat experience. So who wants to talk about like their expat experience first? I feel like it should almost be Misty because is she even a U.S. citizen anymore? Ten years oh, old? Oh, no. You know what, I will say that um, as I was reading, um, as, as we support Black Lives Matter and we understand how atrocious the systemic racism in America actually is and how pervasive it is and pretty much every industry that it, they try to squelch our voice. But I feel that one of the most important things about when we talk about leaving America because we're just so over it, it's to understand our American privilege and how that is our country. Our, our ancestors did build this country. And no matter where you go, you will never, you should never give up your American passport and citizenship. You should retain that because a lot of people do, they like, their entire efforts are to get out of their third world country situations, their caste system situations. They're oppressive, real oppressive from birth. I'll never be able to make it out of this situation. They try to make it to first world countries to be afforded the opportunity to really um, live a better life that they will never ever be able to get at home. So as people are talking about moving out the country and as those do move out the country, do not ever as a black American give up your American citizenship. You, yeah, it's, it's for, for all of the things that need improvement, it is still such a privilege and um, there are so many benefits as well. Right. There's a lot that needs to be fixed, but it's kind of like, you can look at it glass half full, glass half empty. Um, but yeah, I would agree not to. Are people saying that? That they want to give up their U.S. citizenship? Um, I mean, I've seen some people that say it. They're like, fuck it. I'm over the entire situation. But I will say yeah, I've, but I've been an expat in Kuwait for the last, what, four? This is my fifth year here now. And mm -hmm. I, what I really is highlighted, no matter where you go, when they ask where you're from, they're asking two questions, like, where are you from? As in, where is your citizenship status? And where is your lineage traced to? And so as Black Americans, most of us, even if you do your ancestry DNA.com test, you know, you don't, you don't, a lot of us don't have cultural ties with the African countries we are traced back to. So right. in Kuwait, it highlights very, it's very, they want to treat you a certain way until they find out that you're American and then they're just like, oh, okay, well, we can't, we can't do that to her. We can't just shit on her. We can't mistreat her. You know, she actually is a person. Like, you're not three-fifths of a person. You're a one whole person. But in America, we're just like, what? So I think it's very important, like, to identify what privileges it gets you because you get to go through different lines. They're going to treat you with a higher level of respect just based off of the country that you're coming from. So that's very important. Don't you what see else? that light bulb go on, like, right when they make that connection? You see the light bulb, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Things it's change. it's yes. so funny. Every time, it's like a, oh, and a complete attitude shift. Well, I know, it's, like, it's, a few episodes ago, we, we did discuss this. We were talking about, um, the question was brought up, do you feel more female or do you feel more black? And at that time, I'd said, I typically feel more female when I'm traveling, but when I'm in the US, I feel more black. And it's such a weird dichotomy to go from being in the US and 
sometimes feeling kind of like you're out of place or like you don't belong, even though this is your home. My parents are from here. My parents' parents are from here. My parents' parents' parents are from here. And then you go out somewhere else and because you're American, suddenly you're afforded everything that an American is afforded, regardless of your color. And then you realize, oh, being American gets me something, just not in America. I remember watching that episode and I remember discussing it with you guys afterwards. And I would have to say, first and foremost, I always feel black, no matter where I'm going, even if I am in, um, you know, a black country or a predominantly black country. And then, you know, right on the heels of it, um, female, because of just wanting to make sure that no matter where I am, like I'm just being safe in these spaces. Mm -hmm. But um, no, I just, I feel like it just from the way we were raised, you have to carry yourself a certain way and it could be because of you know like the state of affairs for the last 450 years in America how black people have been perceived that you have to be beyond reproach to even mm -hmm. be considered a human being um, before you know for them to take for people to feel comfortable to say I don't see color because we carry ourselves a certain way and that always is the first thing like in my mind and I I almost have to like tell myself depending on like where I am like you deserve to be here you belong they don't know what you have they don't know who you are you know what I mean and you don't have to you don't have to prove yourself yeah can we just take a quick aside and say how annoying is it when you hear people say I don't see color I do, I'm, it's so annoying. Like, really? You don't? So I'm clear. I'm clear now? <laughs> you I, don't, I just don't even know how to respond to that. I don't, I'm like, really? Okay. I, you know and what I will say? That it's a, it's a very impressive thing that if you're well-spoken, you're attacked from both sides. So if you're, if you're well-spoken, you're, you're white, black. And if you're well-spoken in the white circles, you get to the point where it, they, it, you pass, right? So you can, you have the lighter complexions that can pass for different races and they receive a different, maybe a different kind of treatment. I know people say it doesn't happen, but I really find that. I think at some point though, you get to, if you can convey your thoughts in a clear manner, you get to the point where they're just like, well, she's kind of not like the rest of them. So mm -hmm. they start to view you different. And then if you put in any kind of economical um, advancement that you've been able to make, once you pull yourself out of all of that, it, the, the reaction is like, ah, okay. It's like they don't, they almost don't even see you as a black woman. They just see you as another human because now, well, you're not, you're not associated with whatever negative stereotype they gave you yeah. via television or interactions or just they're lit like they're just how they were raised. You know what I'm saying? And, and that is in, a, in and of itself a problem because then some people settle in that space and they want to just, they just want to be normal. You know, they don't want to feel normal and not feel discriminated against. But I feel that on this topic of moving out of America, we need to recognize that you can leave America, we can have secondary homes across the world, you can invest in those countries, and I would say wisely choose countries that give you secondary citizenship that holds enough power that if the American citizen, American America as a whole, and they lose their value in their citizenship, you still are in a powerful nation. And that's really what we have to recognize sometimes as Black Americans, starting and low level and infiltrating um basically that's exactly politics. that's exactly it misty i was reading um an article that former president obama wrote about okay so the the outrage the just the feeling of despair and anxiety and just you know all this stuff that is has culminated to the situation that a lot of states are experiencing he's like now policy change that's really where it is and that's state and local like we need to really break down um our understanding of how to make these things happen and how to 
enforce these policies because it's easy to say it, but like, okay, let's do the research and let's get involved in our local elections. Let's get involved in um, these, because that's where a lot of the policy changes take place. He was like, mm -hmm, he was right. saying that everyone looks at the, you know, executive branch, they look up at the president, they're like, oh, okay, he's the one that's going to make all these changes. No, it's your states that do it because federal, the federal government doesn't want to, you know, be um, big brother, you know, and that's the, yeah. the whole point of it is that uh, people, supporters and allies and the black community as a whole needs to focus our efforts on that now. And that is the biggest thing. I, I think the protests are so important about for bringing about awareness. Yeah. But they don't necessarily bring about long-term change, even after all that's happened. And it's so important that the four officers complicit in the murder of George Floyd are all being brought up on charges. But that's not enough. That's not even near justice. The fact that that could happen that you could watch a video of him so casually just standing or kneeling on someone's neck, that, that is systemic and that starts from voting. So I, I know that's come up with a few people. They're like, well, what do we do now? Because you're kind of at that point, like, do protests stop? Because we said if they get arrested, then protests stop. But we, we can't be done with this movement because it'll just be next year we're right back in it it's happened since what 2013 there's been a death that brings about like the social awareness every year and then it fades into the background and that's what to me when people are talking about we need to bring awareness to the issue awareness is there we need to keep the spotlight on and we need to bring about awareness to the laws that are allowing these things to happen continuously. So like bring awareness. I'm like, it's who doesn't know? Well, that's the who thing. It's, it depends on how it's being targeted because I feel like in the past, a lot of it has been targeted at black people and black people are like, yeah, we know this is a problem. We're telling you it's a problem. Colin Kaepernick was kneeling saying that this was a problem. It's people outside of the, was. right? But people outside of the diaspora, they are not understanding that this is, this is a fear that we live with. Even as the three of us, if I get pulled over by a police officer, my mind immediately goes to like Sandra Bland and I start getting really anxious. Is there any reason that I should get anxious? Particularly if you think that we grew up like Misty said, with people thinking because we speak like we speak, we're the, we're the good kind of black, or we're not like them, and you're like, okay, this friendship's got to end, because now I realize who you are and what you think of me and also anyone that looks like me. But generally, right. the fact that someone who I've met people, they were like, well, you're not really black, but I still have that fear of getting pulled who over. Who said that to you? You know. <laughs> well, I mean, like, childhood. Childhood is traumatic. Childhood is traumatic oh, for everyone. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, that's, uh, like, all of, I just feel like it just sucked for the people that are like, oh, my God, like, high school is so great, or I did that, I did that. I'm like, man, no. Kids are assholes, and still are. Like, <laughs> that was not enjoyable for me, but also... <laughs> <laughs> just the entire school experience. I'm sorry. That was not that's enjoyable. Me. <laughs> but I mean, okay, so currently two out of three of us do live out the country. The army lives in the Bahamas, which is technically a black country. And I live in Kuwait, um, which is in the Middle East, an hour and a half from Dubai. So it's an Arab country and culture, um, Muslim, their predominant rela uh, religion here, if actually not the religion. Uh, so I want to say, let's address like people talking about moving out of the country. There yeah. is discrimination wherever you go. So don't think that you move and you shake it, period. Um, no matter yeah. if you're in Asia, cause Lexi lived in Japan for two and a half years. Mm -hmm. So in Asian countries, just like give, maybe not a horror story, but I guess kind of like where you felt as a black person, an outsider, or you and your friends of uh, color, realize that this is not really where you're from that's a challenge because 
I don't think I had any other like friends of color when I was in Japan because that's, I'm going to put it like this. People that look like me are not typically the primary people that are like, I love Japanese culture and I want to go there. It's usually right. a lot of like Wu-Tang Clan. <laughs> <laughs> what? Sorry. I know Riz is all about uh, the culture there, but yeah, I, I, in general, I would say that I didn't have a lot of people of color. What you do find is that you feel like an outsider there. And I would put it like this. That is a place where you feel American privilege as a black person because if I was black and not American or black and not British, um, that would have felt really awkward because they have a small African population. And I mean, I assume everyone's seen like those random things that'll pop up on different Asian outlets. Like, did you see the controversy about that commercial where they had a black guy Good looking. In the and then they put him in the washing machine yes. and he popped out as a Japanese guy. And they're like, get clean. And you're like, oh, someone allowed you to do that. But that's yeah. because it's a homogenous society and no one told them that's actually really troubling for a lot of people. For them, right. they're just like, something got lighter, which of course people in Asia would feel that way because they put bleaching um ingredients into all of their skincare. It's it's such a weird thing to be there because they they don't know blackness and therefore if all they're taking in from it is what they're ingesting from the media, they have an inherent fear of blackness and it doesn't like um come out as violent. I never felt endangered while I was there, but you would definitely feel isolated until they realize you're American. And that's, it's its own thing. It's not as inherently dangerous as being in the US knowing that you could get killed and there would never be any justice for your death. That's a different type of tragedy, but it's a, yeah. it's a lower grade tra tragedy, but it's something that you feel in your life every single day and in every interaction that you have. And, it's like death by a thousand cuts, basically. Right. And then the, there's the, in Southeast Asia, like you said, all lotions come with bleaching cream in them. Like 95% of the lotions that are out have bleaching cream in them. If you don't want it, they're confused as to why you wouldn't want to be lighter. So if you're like no one confused and you go there, bring your own lotion. Don't, don't trust their lotion, their sunscreen, unless you're trying to come back with a tan, but also lighter. <laughs> You know, that reminds me of how I, I bought some lotion and it was the exact opposite. It was like a skin, um, uh, like colored, like a Sally Hansen, but it was uh -huh. uh, the Vaseline brand, I believe. And it had like that, like coloring agent in it. And I, I just remember thinking, oh, this is like thick. So I thought it was just like, oh, it's like shea butter and like some other stuff, you know, I read the <laughs> ingredients. It wasn't until I looked at it and it said like, whatever it was, glow. And I look, it was like, so subtly it'll make your skin darker the more you use it and i was like what the wow f was this in the bahamas no this was in the states oh. in florida of course never mind <laughs> i was gonna be like shout out to bahamians for loving their skin color they're like i want That's so right? much that i want more they never mind reaching out here too they have like on mm -hmm. um on facebook like it'll have um the marketplace right where people sell stuff and skin bleaching services, skin bleaching creams, it is all over the place. And then you see these people um, with like that, that greenish, yellowish, like eerie looking tent. I just, it, no, it doesn't go away. Colorism in, in many countries because of just the European conquering of nations, lighter, brighter, better. It's, yeah. it's all over the place. So That's in the Bahamas, Diambe, do you feel like, what do you feel? Do you feel like you're home because you're amongst um, a melanated people? Do you, are they more accepting? I have to say no. Um, I don't, <laughs> categorically. <laughs> there with that. Um, so I, you would think so, but the, um, the Bahamas was, an English colony 
up until I think 19 in 1970s, I want to say 1976. Um, when they, Damn, they held on that long. Yeah, man. Until yeah. they gained their independence. They didn't fight for it. The, you know, they just like applied for it. And the British crown was like, all right, cool. Like, bye. It's, it's been real. No hard feelings kind of a thing. So when you come here, um, they really focus on the tourists, the white tourists. Those are the ones mm -hmm. that they think have money. If you're black, you basically saved enough money to get over here. And now you're like frugally spending because you don't have that much to spend. Um, I've had a couple of instances where like they think that I'm Bahamian until I open my mouth. <laughs> And then they're like, yeah, you might one of us. So sometimes uh, I've, I've had only a handful of experiences in the last um, year plus that I've been here where um, I just, it felt in my soul, like inviting. Otherwise they'll try to like mess with you by, you know, speak, and they speak English. It's an English speaking country, but they speak like um, fast, like pigeon type uh, fast. Mm -hmm. So they'll just try to throw you off and, um, just kind of mess with you and that's not unique to the bahamas that's anywhere like yeah. they know you're not one of them they just try to like just mess with you a little bit um but as far as just feeling like i'm home i'm amongst my people no i i can't say that i've i felt like that but i didn't feel like that in atlanta either oh god it's, it's a different culture atlanta's definitely changing in my opinion but it's different yeah, I think, I don't know. I feel like as a black American, the the general diaspora is always feeling like you're slightly out of place. Like exactly. there's nowhere I've been in the world that I felt like this is exactly, this is exactly where I should be at this time type of thing. Like I've had times and places in my life where I'm like, oh, this is where I want to be. But it's it's not like you walk into a place and arms are open and they're welcoming you in because no matter where you go, you're always kind of an outsider. And that's ridiculous that it's even in the US because like we said, we're, we're not really, like we couldn't trace our lineage to immigration. Mm -hmm we came over, I would assume our ancestors came over on a slave boat based on all we know. So yeah. it's, it's ridiculous to feel like you, it's not even that I, I don't want to say I feel like I don't belong because that's not it. This is my home. When, when I left Japan after two and a half years and I came back, I felt like, oh my God, I'm home. But you definitely don't feel like you are the, um, the standard. So Japan is really interesting because it's a homogenous society. It's very much one culture. And you even see it like with their tennis star, uh, I can't remember her first name, but Osaka, who had like beat Serena Williams. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Like she's half African, half Japanese. And for the longest time, they wouldn't really claim her until she was a winner. And they're like, well, when he takes precedence, so now, yeah, she's Japanese. But even then, there's probably still a very awkward feeling about it. And so when you go there, I imagine someone who's Japanese and born Japanese, they just feel like, of course, this is, of course I'm from here. I feel very connected to this place. Whereas if you're Black and American, I don't know if you feel that same connection. Because I feel like there's, I mean... I'll put it like this. Did you guys ever get into a fight with like a white kid at school and they're like, go back to Africa? Yeah. Yeah, I used to um, say it all the time. Right. They exactly. were Mexico. The fact Imagine. that all of us had that experience and you're like, yeah, I'll go back to Africa, but then you get to Africa and, and Missy, you could speak to like Ghana and Kenya, but they know you're not African. And that's the same in the Bahamas like the Bahamas, they know you're not Bahamian. So we're just a people kind of out of place. Which is Misty, when, why did your face why, just? Hi. I said, "Why did your face just fall?" Like they know. Who told them? <laughs> <laughs> I've been passing. I've been working really hard. No, um, I will say that it's it's uh, yeah. I mean, like um, <clears throat> so I went to. I'm so sorry. I went to Ghana last year, 
for the year of the return. And um, I absolutely love Ghana. The spirit of the people and the country was just really vibracious. Um, I had a, a great time there. It has a, they're very entrepreneurial. It has a very movement type of like, we're going to get a lot of accomplished. And they said that they were able to make off the year of the return from just black people, regardless of <clears throat> your nationality. They made $1.4 billion, which right. was incredible. Awesome. Like it was a huge one, a huge win for them. And so they were I was listening to the news. They're like, okay, so what do we do now that we've done the year of return? It's so now they're doing a, a thing called beyond the return. Yeah. And they are encouraging black Americans to move there. But I will say that I'm at the point where I was telling Lexi earlier, like it's very important for us to, to plan wealth building doesn't just come overnight. You know, you have to have a one, three, five, 10 year vision and plan for your life. Like how you're going to execute different phases and one of the things that our community lacks severely is um financial literacy and how we actually get there so i was thinking in 10 years i want to be close to being able to retire and i've been looking for um, a place where i want my basic like vacation secondary home to be and in that country i would like it to have uh have a stronger citizenship uh, so that i could acquire that once i do buy a property there so these are things that I was looking at. I, I would love to buy it in an African country. But the other thing we have to consider is when we take our, our time, energy, effort, and money, because we are an outsider, even though they want to welcome us there, we are going in on a different playing field. Like you're not just, they, when Ghana says they want Black Americans to come, they're not saying we want the poor, broke Black Americans to come. They're saying we want somebody that's going to come and invest in our infrastructure in our country and help us, you know, move forward. You are part of our diaspora. You are part of our cloth. Yes, you have lineage, but we want you to have some kind of money. So for investment purposes that we can um, circulate in and, and basically build up our, our country. So we consider that when you move out of America, you're taking your, your dollar with you and you're investing in another country's financial infrastructure when you should be doing the same thing at home. We should be yeah. buying yes. predominantly black businesses. We should be supporting um, anything black over going to even a commercial um, like complex. If, if somebody could sell you the hair product, then you should be going to that black business as opposed to the Asian owned hair store. If you can figure out how to get some of your groceries from a a locally owned black co-op, then we should avoid the Kroger, Ralph, Albertsons, Walmart grocery stores. So that's what they're asking us to do when they say we want our come home. It's twofold. And I will say I loved it there, but I'm not tied into the African culture. Like I'm not a Ghanaian citizen and I don't have family members there. There's, there's just little cultural things that we totally don't need, just the level of respect they give their, their elders. How you refer to, like calling auntie, who you call auntie to, who you can actually call by their name. How you give that, like those are things that we'd have to learn once there. And because it's not naturally something we grew up with, you're gonna feel like an outsider. You know, you don't speak the language. That's another thing when you think about moving to another country. Do you speak that language? Is English a predominant, is the predominant language? like? It, it's one of those, like, I, I just I just keep in mind when I buy there. And then how stable is their economy? Because yeah. Black Americans have it hard in our country, in America. But imagine taking $100,000, however you got it, to buy something in another country. Then they have a huge regime change. And then you lose everything. And they put you out because you are not from that country. Or you, <laughs> you, you obtain the citizenship, and then they still took it. That happens. 60% of the world. No, I, I don't think the solution is leaving the U.S. I believe me, I loved my experience of being an expat. And no matter what I will ever say about Japan and like feeling other while I was there, it was a formative part of my life. And I absolutely 
it was amazing. But at the same time, I knew that that was not home. And there's a lot in that culture that's set up to make sure that you know that you're always a guest there. And that's fine. I, I didn't expect to go to Japan and feel like that was home for me. So when I came back home, you realize that you've got to look around and see what's going on in the world and how you can make it the best place. Because for me, America is home. And, and that's, so now we have to figure out the infrastructural changes that we need to make. Mm -hmm. Right. For the next episode, we want to get into maybe talk about, um, we need to talk about like pros and cons of being an expat, being homesick, moving, and then we like wrap it up with the countries that are black people friendly and cheap countries to live in.